anything, any query, any questions, any problem which you are going through, anything which you have in your mind, you are free to talk. But then there is some time restraint, so please see to it that you don't exceed four to five minutes. And our ladies, they will come and pick up your names, the ones who want to speak. Should you just write your names and give to the ladies, and we'll call out your names, and you should come one by one and speak on those issues. In the meanwhile, I'll uh, respect, I'll uh, ask Shri uh, Ajit Nagpalji, who's an authority in medical industry in India, to say a few words and enlighten our brothers and sisters regarding the medical possibilities and the medical uh, opportunities in India. my colleagues on the dais, fellow delegates from across the world. It's a, a privilege for me to share the scenario of healthcare across the world and very specifically in Indian subcontinent. I do believe that we have many delegates here who come from medical disciplines and other allied sciences associated with medicine. And to see that what has happened in the last two decades in the Indian subcontinent. You see, um, just briefly, I want to share with you that most countries in the world have a social agenda and a political mandate of universal and equitable access to healthcare. This is universal, irrespective of the fact whether you are uh, in, the, in, in the United States or in Canada or any other developing country, and irrespective of the economy. But the quality of health care that you deliver depends on your economic strength. Because financing comes in a very big way to support health care infrastructure and health care delivery. In Indian subcontinent, we've seen that the last 15 to 20 years have seen the growth of corporate sector, principally because the public sector has failed to deliver the mandate that is set by us, our leaders, since 1947, and that is equitable access to healthcare. And therefore, by virtue of market econo economic forces, private sector has come in in a big way. But even today, we are literally short of almost 5 lakh nurses, we are short of about 2 lakh doctors, we are short of 50,000 beds, and there is a room for investment in healthcare. So government has recently embarked upon a strategy that can we have public-private partnerships and develop healthcare infrastructure in this country. And fifth five-year plan is focused on that. So coming from the perspective of our delegates from all over the world, there's a room for investment in healthcare, and there's room to return home. I'm not saying that our good friends who are very well settled abroad are invited, or yes, they are invited, but it's not mandatory. But it's for the young people that you must encourage people of Indian origin who have skills to come back home and serve this country. There will be opportunities, and there will be equal opportunities that they get anywhere in the world. With these words, I invite you once again and it's a very great opportunity for me to share these thoughts with you. And thank you very much. I now invite Dr. Priti Seth from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. So 
From actually, I left India in 1982, and I spent about 20 years in Saudi. It was a totally life-changing experience for me, because uh, working here at the All India Institute, we never felt that we were in any way different from the men, and we were treated equally, completely. But once you reach Saudi Arabia, you see what is the difference, and you really begin to appreciate your own culture and the freedom that you have here. It is actually uh, truly a kingdom, and it is a very conservative uh, Islamic society, as you will see for a, a few of the pictures I will show you here. Um, just to refresh your memory on the geography of Saudi Arabia, Um, you know, Saudi is uh, a whole sort of subcontinent almost, and it's pretty much a desert. Uh, Riyadh being the capital city is right in the center of the desert. And Daman, which is in the Gulf region, is next to the sea. Now, there are a lot of, uh, you know, tribal affiliations in Saudi, as well as, uh, you know, the Shias and the Sunnis are very much divided. The northern, the eastern province is mostly Shias. And that's when I began to work initially uh, in the Ministry of Health. Right, next slide. So these are some glimpses of Saudi. You can see the desert uh, contrasting with the, where the tents are, and that's where the Bedouins live. And we did have patients who came right from there. And there are other others. You can see Riyadh, the big city with all the tall buildings and all the modern facilities. And I had an opportunity to work there as well. So next slide, please. Um, yes, Saudi society, as I mentioned, is very male dominated, strictly Islamic. We had to stop work during prayer times. Even if you were doing ward rounds or you were doing clinics or whatever, you had to stop and you had to let everybody go to pray. Um, in the, during Ramadan time, everything was in the night, nothing in the day at all. So we were working from 9 o'clock to 12 or 1 o'clock in the night, you know, even blood donations or anything. Because people were fasting during the day, you couldn't obviously take blood from them during the day when they were fasting. Um, and there's, there was a lot of social segregation, even at conferences. If I compare where you're sitting together here, talking, eating, everything together, it would be unthinkable in Saudi. Whenever we did have a meeting, the women were on one side, the men were on the other side, there was a partition in between, and you know, we literally had to crane our necks to see what was going on. And the, we would have to take permission from the hotel beforehand if we could have uh, meetings there. So it was all very interesting. Next slide, please. Um, just to give you a glimpse of Saudi women, most of the time the women are totally covered. That doesn't prevent them, however, from doing the activities they want. And you can see there's somebody there on a jet ski in an abaya, and people would swim with abayas, you know, and uh, women would go around their usual uh, activities. But it was odd if somebody wished you good morning, and you didn't know who was wishing you good morning, because she was completely veiled. So I, I sort of um, used to try and identify people just by their hands or their feet. Um, next slide, please. So I started work at uh, the Regional Laboratory and Blood Bank because I'm a hematologist, basically, and I didn't want to do anything else. And we had a good mixture of uh, people with us. There were Saudis, there were Egyptians, there were all the Arabs. Uh, Palestinians and Filipinos and, and everybody. And it was very interesting to see how everyone reacted with each other. We worked very well together. The lab was actually a, a referral center for the entire eastern province. And so we used to get all the difficult cases that other hospitals couldn't handle. Next slide, please. So um, I saw a lot of very complex hematological problems there. Because uh, firstly, there's a sickle cell anemia and the thalassemias and you know the hemoglobin H diseases and all that. Especially with the consanguinity, uh, you got a lot of unusual red cell disorders which were inherited. 
and also, you know, the uh, trans blood transfusions and sicklers and thalassemics, we had a lot of uh, chance to see complex problems. Uh, there were some uh, uh, conferences organized, an international conference, and we did present some data. The good thing about Saudi in one way for a doctor was that because it was more or less uncharted territory at the time I went there, there wasn't too much data on things. And so whatever we observed was pretty much new. And people were willing to, the rest of the world was willing to hear about it. So we did have a chance to present, you know, the different complex things we saw there. Then, of course, the Gulf War, it happened while I was there. And uh, there are lots of stories associated with that, with that. But I won't go into that except to say that we, it was a chance for us to expand the blood transfusion services. And one thing the Saudi government did do uh, at the time was uh, that they made it mandatory for all people who wanted a driver's license to come and donate blood. Uh, because otherwise, voluntary donation would be quite hard. You know, Saudis are very conservative. They're not willing to donate blood. And I think this was a very good way of ensuring that the blood bank always had a supply of blood. Next, please. So from there, uh, uh, I moved to King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh, which is actually a premier tertiary care hospital uh, of the country. And uh, I had a, a chance to work with uh, you know, uh, people from uh, the West, from uh, Australia, from all over. And again, you know, to uniform, uh, make the uniform treatment, because everywhere the practice of medicine is slightly changes, varies according to the patients. But here everybody came and you know kind of conformed, which was really nice to see. And we, we were able to treat again tertiary care problems in hematology. Next, please. Uh, so we were uh, dealing with mostly all the uh, leukemias, uh, you know, lymphomas and myelomas, and doing bone marrow transplants. And it was quite easy in, in Saudi to get um, sibling donors because they have large families and extended families. And so we, we hardly ever were, were doing unmatched trans, uh, transplants. They were all uh, matched related uh, bone marrow transplants. And uh, the other thing was that because uh, you know there was no hemophilia program, so the department started also the first Saudi hemophilia program. We, uh, we organized the first international Saudi uh, hemophilia conference and bleeding disorders conference. It was a wonderful clinical experience uh, that I got there. Plus, I was able to share my culture with the others who came from various parts of the world. Everybody was interested in everybody else. And even the Saudi newspaper used to have one page devoted to almost two or three countries. Like one was to North America, Canada. The other one was India, Pakistan, you know, this. And so it was, I mean, uh, I learned so much there. <laughs> about um, different cultures and uh, people, and it was very nice, really. There was a good Indian Doctors Association there, and we were able to um, you know, speak there and meet other Indian doctors, very active, I would say. Saudi Arabia has a lot of Indian physicians. They are very well respected because they're hardworking, they're uh, sincere, they don't indulge in any politicking anywhere. They just come, do their work well, go home and contribute to the society. Next, uh, next slide. Um, and then, um, since my daughter was studying in this school initially, so uh, the first managing committee from the parent side was uh, elected, and it was in 1998, and uh, I was part of that. So it was a chance for me to do something uh, at, the, at the community level as well for the Indian community. And we had a special care center for handicapped children because in, at that time in Saudi, the expat community uh, who had handicapped children could not put their people anywhere, put their children anywhere. And so this was a very worthwhile experience uh, at that time for me too. Next, please. So I would say that uh, despite the fact that I had to face a lot of restrictions as a woman, I think overall I, was a, I did grow there quite a bit. I learned so many things there and had very rich cultural experiences as well. 
and uh, I, I think I must say that I motivated several people to come to India and did take back loads and loads of stuff. Somebody wanted a sari, somebody wanted this, that or the other. And they, they came to India and enjoyed it, really. Um, next, please. So now, um, I mean, I do divide my time between here and the US, and um, I feel that this, uh, we need to raise a health awareness here quite a bit. Even those who are very educated in, um, and living here, they are pretty much, I, I think, not taking care of their health. And what we really need is more of health education in the Indian society, because we are catching up very fast with all the diseases that we do not want. All the Western style diseases of lifestyle diseases are coming here. And I think that uh, it's very essential for doctors to be able to contribute to raise health awareness about proper eating, diet, proper uh, health care and exercise, everything. Um, and I think Delhi is an area where there is a lot of uh, thalassemia. I saw that when I was working at the All India Institute before I left. And I know they've made big strides with the thalassemia society and uh, with, uh, genetic, with counseling, premarital, and I think we need to step up a little more effort, um, just like perhaps Cyprus has done. Um, they've almost brought down the level of their thalassemia patients because they've been very strict with the premarital counseling and premarital testing. And I think that uh, whatever we can do with all the knowledge besides the high high tech treatments that we have, we need to stay with the basics as well. Uh, thank you for giving me your time, and uh, I would like to hear about the others too. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have actually Joginder Singh Ji, former chief of CBI amongst us. Uh, please give a ovation for him, please. Uh, uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Sayyid Ashfaq from Saudi Arabia. Classify ourselves 
as less conservative. So that's the biggest, you know, like alignment along with our cultures. And secondly, the kind of opportunities that you really have in that country, because it's a growing country, it's a developing country, it's not classified as developed. And if you see the growth in Saudi Arabia, majorly the contribution has come from Indian subcontinent. So I think that's the call for pat on our backs. And Saudi government itself recognizes the efforts, the kind of achievements that we being Indians have really given to their growth. If I may have to share your few statistics, last quarter, the kind of remittances that has come from Saudi Arabia, from Indian community itself, is 82 billion rupees, which is phenomenal. And this has been acknowledged by King Abdullah, the patron of Saudi Arabia himself. He has written a thank letter to our Indian ambassador and said that the kind of growth that you have provided for the last 40 years of Saudi growth or economic growth has really boosted the morale of Saudis. And they really recognize that they are now inviting Indians especially when compared to other communities to come and do businesses in Saudi Arabia. Recently there was a delegation which was led by our own Honorable Minister, Mr. Waila Ravi. He had come along with a delegation there and met with Saudi businessmen where lots of deals have been finalized and that way he has paved the way for Indian businesses to come into Saudi Arabia. Now I myself work for a company as general manager for their IT division plus I own a company called Innovative Technologies Private Limited. Now we are into IT services. I have brought many of my friends into Saudi market and especially they are from India and US regions and they are doing pretty well. And we have seen even because of the economic downturn across West and Europe, there's hardly an impact on Saudi Arabian market. So I think we should capitalize on that. And yes, when you have started growing your business in Saudi Arabia, so obviously you have that kind of leverage to really open up an offshore kind of sector in India as well. So that way you have good growth opportunity in Saudi Arabia and then thereby you are also connected to your own homeland. What about the future of our younger generation? Now, if Dr. Preeti, I'm sure she will agree upon uh, with me because as far as education was concerned for our kids, after 9th or 10th, the parents used to plan of sending their kids back to India or some other part of the world for their higher education because 11th, 12th standards were not existing at this point in time. But now not only high school education is available, but also universities have started coming up. We have already spoken to Indian ambassador, and that way we are forcing that, now Bits Pilani, they have already arrived in UAE. So that proposal is also being extended to Saudi Arabia. So as far as that kind of situation is concerned, the education part is also taken care of, and a lot of universities have come up in Saudi Arabia where they give opportunities to expat children. So it's a win-win situation and as far as myself is concerned, what I believe is, I think the way we have achieved or received a legacy from our parents, from our seniors or our elders, it becomes a moral responsibility to impart the same to our future generations. And considering that fact, I'm also a member of Indian Business Forum in Saudi, Indian Engineers Forum and a member of Toastmasters international. So what we do is by getting associated with these kind of forums, we provide platform to the people who would like to really explore opportunities in Saudi Arabia, plus who would like to also get connected back in India. Now people of Indian origin and NRIs in Saudi Arabia are really doing a great job as far as marketing that Indian capability is concerned. Now if you see any organization in Saudi Arabia, be it from Aramco to Sabic to any medium scale industry, you will see an Indian really contributing to that company's growth. So this has been acknowledged by Saudi government, this has been acknowledged by 
Saudi businessmen, henceforth, they have given an open invitation for all of us. Now, I think this is a beautiful platform and our welfare society is providing us to really explore these kind of opportunities, help ourselves, help India in providing that kind of growth and enhance our future leaders' growth, that is our children. So as part of my Toastmastering experience, what we do is we really conduct youth leadership programs to the children who are studying in Indian schools and other schools as well, like multinational schools, plus speech craft program for seniors. Because what we believe is, if you want to be a successful businessman or a professional, the basic tool or the guideline that's required is the communication skills and presentation skills, where people have really faltered on that particular platform and we provide that platform. And that has been really, you know, as, as Dr. Preeti has mentioned in her slides, that being a conservative community in Saudi Arabia, they don't allow this kind of mix-up of genders. But in the last five to seven years, the, the, the Saudi culture has really opened up. The market has really opened up. Now you, you might have heard that even ladies have got seats in the assembly of, you know, the, the, the Saudi Council of Ministers. So that way, they are being promoted. Now, there have been recently, uh, in fact, three days back, I've read a news that they have opened up 500 employment centers across Saudi Arabia for ladies itself. So that way, the market is opening up. So it's not, if let's say ladies want to really start some business in Saudi Arabia, there are lots of ladies, women, who have been classified as the top 100 business women of Saudi Arabia. And they are looking for some dynamic ladies across the world who can really help them in growing their businesses. Henceforth, I invite you all and you can really get in touch with me or your friends or colleagues who are residing in Saudi Arabia and explore these kind of opportunities and help yourself, your future generation and India's growth. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Jadar, Rajiv Singh Ji, Nagpal Sahib, Handa Sahib, Jadar Singh Ji, ladies and gentlemen. I must first of all apologize for uh, coming late. Uh, there is a VIP culture here. I think all the traffic is stopped. So it took about seven minutes for that and then accumulated traffic to clear. Because uh, Delhi has a population of uh, nearly 16 million. It has got, I think, nearly 8 million cars. So, so there, is, uh, there is every possibility of being stuck up. That normal traffic speed is between 12 to 14 kilometers an hour. So my apologies, I, there is no justification. First, uh, delay was by the train. The second, by the consequent factors on which one has no control. Uh, one small request. Uh, it doesn't look proper for anybody in the dais to say hey, your time is up. May I request that you kindly have the self-imposed limitation of four to five minutes uh, so that I, uh, the repeteers can take note of the problem. I know you are doing a great job. That's why you are there. Uh, maybe your sisters were there. Maybe you found there's better opportunities abroad. Thrive, live well. And probably India is one of the very few countries in the world which takes care of its, uh, at least uh, has a meeting as kind of a platform for them to meet and express their problem. After all, what you can solve by discussion is not something you can solve by threatening. Uh, thanks to LM Singhvi's report, that is NRI Divis, Divis has been put on a firm footing. Uh, one thing you must have noticed, the moment you come to India, you feel one of them. You, I mean, it is strange, but the fact is that even our mother tongue may not be the same. I belong to Mysore, now called Karnataka cadre of the Indian Police Service. I and my minister, late Gundara, who became chief minister later on, we went to Iran. And we were speaking in English. The Iranian counterpart of my minister said, why don't you speak in your own language? 
I said, look, his mother tongue and my mother tongue is different. We can speak only in English. So, what I would only request you is, a small suggestion as well as a request for your consideration. We know India is still not the ideal country for the criminal justice system. It can take hundreds of years here. Uh, Bernard Shah said, Pool and his money are soon parted. I will only give a word of caution. Please be careful where you invest money in, not only in India, but anywhere in the world here, because there are many fly-by-night operators who would like to take advantage of that. I do not know how much time that caution has been set here, but I thought I can. And the worst part is, sometimes your closest friends and relatives are the bigger offenders. You buy some property, you give it to them, and then you find that they have four documents, and then they have taken uh, note of that. So don't blame the system. System is pretty bad in the sense that we have not reformed the legal system. Uh, uh, strength of the infra infrastructure is not as good as it should be. We have only 9.5 judges per million population, whereas worldwide norm is something like 50. So it takes time. So I would only say this to you. You are welcome to this place. India will always have a place, whether people have been thrown out of Uganda, or Myanmar or Sri Lanka, they have always found a home in India. I think I mentioned last year, but since audience difference can be a repetition a story. A classmate of mine, a couple of years back, his name was Skandar Singh. He settled in England and he acquired British citizenship. You know, when you come, they say Indian nationals and other foreign nationals. So this chap stood in the Commonwealth Nationals queue. So one official said, Sadaji to see the Kareo, where are you standing? He says, uh, I have English citizenship. He says, to see the graves one day. To see the So wherever you are, you will always be welcome in India, whatever be the state here. But I will say here, uh, while it's good to be trustworthy, Trust, trustful of others and trustworthy, but it is still better to safeguard your uh, own trust. Now I'll uh, request Mr. Shri Syed Abedi Sahib from UK.
very thankful to the organization committee, particularly Brenda Singh and his family, who are carrying forward the great vision their father had. And I really like to, to hail his uh, late father for his vision. And I'm very glad to see that his children are carrying forward that his, his, his vision and also furthering it, adding more and more new generation, new dimensions to it. Uh, a great deal has been said about the contribution of the NRIs to the development of India and also the efforts which are being made by the NOCs and the government authorities to further and further the, uh, the Indian economy and uh, the making room for Indians uh, all around the world. Uh, a great deal has been said yesterday by the distinguished speakers uh, about covering all grounds, about where further investment, further contribution can be made by the NRIs and where the government of India can take action to improve the situation. I would particularly like to quote the case which was very well made by Jessica Kaju, who put forward the various cases and various arguments that uh, highlights what can be done further and what is not being done. I fully and totally wholeheartedly support the arguments made by Mr. Kaju. And uh, there's no point in me repeating all that because all of you gentlemen who are listening to him very attentively. Followed by Mr. Kaju, a case was, a defensive case was made by Mr. Sabeo, who highlighted the problems that India is facing. India is facing because of the cultural complication, a highly complex culture, because of the level of the poverty, because of uh, the uneven distribution of the wealth and around. I have been hearing this kind of story for a long, long time, I'm afraid. I wish Mr. Sabil was here to listen to my, uh, my, my arguments and my discussions to say that India is not, only the, not the only country who is facing all these complications. And it should really deter India or Indian government to, to put forward and to progress. There are other countries which have a com more complex situation with the the, with, the, with their population, with the status of the poverty, with the level of the income, $2 income, which later on quoted to be a dollar income per head in India, is uh, highlighted. But uh, uh, that should be really taken into consideration in the context of the situation of India. Uh, comparing $1 per head income of an Indian with the income of, uh, of an American or uh, British or is not really a fair because situations are totally very, very different. Uh, I also would like to highlight the situation with the similar countries in the similar situation. Uh, uh, the most, uh, uh, most fr uh, the frontier company is China. China is neck to neck, is competing with India in every respect. The cultural com uh, complications, the domestic problems, which the Chinese have got. I have visited China several times, and I found it an eye-opening experience to see the rate of progress which has been made in the last 20 years in China. And that progress has been made despite all the property. China has got a lot bigger population than what we have. China have got the different cultural thing and the different uh, religious uh, situations, but somehow they put it all in the background and forging ahead and challenging uh, countries like India. India has got a big advantage over China, that being the language, Indians speak la English language thoroughly, fluently, uh, all over the place. Uh, Indian are looked at favorably by the Western world because of the cultural similarities, and they, they get the backing uh, for, for India. The other country which I'd like to highlight in the same situation is Brazil. These are the for four developing countries which have been highlighted who are forging forward their, uh, their progress in, in, uh, and trying to get to take the advantage of the current uh, situation, economical situation in the Western world, particularly the United States and the uh, European Union who are almost bankrupt and are heavily in debt. Uh, it was 
rightly pointed out that India is in a very much very better situation because India did not follow the risky steps which were taken by the Western world and that led them to be bankrupt. So I think that I would like to really uh, say that uh, despite our problems, whatever problem we have got, India, uh, Indians are very proud of the fact that Indians are the only community I have seen across the world who are most patriotic in the nation. No matter where Indian is, he's Indian and he flies the Indian flag and carries on the Indian culture over there. Just to uh, elicit a bit more my uh, arguments which are putting forward, I would like to uh, reiterate my three experiences which I have had. I left India some uh, 66 years ago in 1966 uh, uh, and uh, when I uh, left India as a young, very uh, ambitious person, arrived in the UK simply because I was uh, seeking further opportunities in the higher advanced scientific research. I'm a scientist and that's why I decided to leave India. And when I arrived in the UK, I was fortunate enough to be given to, to secure a place in Cambridge University. Uh, however, having settled down over there, uh, it was only natural for me to ask my, some of my colleagues, what do they think of India and the Indians? And I was really shocked to get the uh, response from them. Uh, they think that, oh, India, India is a big thing that is a chaotic, overcrowded, a highly populated country with a begging ball in their hand. I couldn't put forward the argument at the time because there was some truth in the situation at the time, but now after 46 years having been in the UK, the current situation is the richest man of the United Kingdom is an Indian, Mitchell. And he is supporting the British economy and I hope that he is contributing to the Indian community as well. Uh, the other experience I had over there is uh, to see what is the current situation after 46 years. Now, not only the richest man of uh, India is the middle, but also, uh, not the richest man of uh, Britain is the middle, but not, uh, uh, when I see the scientific world, the leading researchers are Indians, the Indians are parliamentarian, the Indians are uh, acquiring more and more business opportunities uh, uh, there. And the, particularly, the, I would say the majority of the audience over here uh, belong to the medical profession. The medical pro profession in Britain, in Canada, in the United States is dominated by, by the Indians. So there are great opportunities for us to make a room for ourselves. And let's put aside our weaknesses and uh, no doubt we got to address that. It's the responsibility of the Indian government to address these things. But do not forget that there is an opportunity for us. A opening has been made because of the, the economical situation of the United States and Europe uh, where there is a big gap. And that is the opportunity which we should not uh, 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 ignore and we should forge ahead and uh, fill in the gap in the economical world. Uh, and. Uh, and do not allow the Chinese or the Brazilians to, to take snatch this out of our hands. I would like to thank the panel and uh, for giving me the opportunity to address some of my concerns. Of course, there are so many concerns I could speak forever, but I think to stick to my four minutes, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abhiji. I think you are such an example for us. You know, about China, you said something here which I think calls for small intervention. Uh, one thing is the way they can get the things done. We cannot get it done in India because uh, the less the government does in trading and in manufacturing, it is better. The government work is not attuned to run any airline. See, we have, have a loss of something like that will be more than 500, uh, 600 billion sterlings is a loss of the Air India. Same as the, the BOAC. 
when when it was a government bond. But in China, everything is done by the government. I will only give you a small story. The Steve CEO of the Apple, he wanted 70 million iPhone 4s, and he said, "I want them in two months." And what does their his deputy does? He flies to China. He sees around. He goes to the companies. The company says, "Okay." If you give us the contract, we will dedicate its facility. 15 days, we'll build its factory. And we'll stick to the red line. You sign the agreement from that within two months, you have 70 million 4S iPhones. I think which one of them I cracked this morning. And uh, he came, saw it. Midnight, China's midnight, the agreement was signed. The supervisor blew a whistle in the factory. 8,000 dormitory workers, because they have their place of living near them. They came, a cup of tea, four biscuits, get on for the 12 hour shift. That being a communist country, there's no way. I mean, other people could say no, but they have ensured that everybody has a meal, everybody has got the clothing, everybody has got the housing here. And they delivered it. You see, here, those of you who are in business, one of the biggest complaints against the Indian manufacturers and suppliers is that they do not adhere to delivery schedules for the simple reason that sometimes there is no power. I think for the first time when I went to Jalalabad, my district, there was a power for 24 hours because the deputy chief minister of Punjab is a consisting for MLA seat from there. People will go on strike. For flimsiest excuses, they killed Adobe CEO for wages in Noida. The labor minister said here they should listen to them instead of taking sides of the companies here. So there are certain advantages in democracy, there are certain advantages in democratic system. And unfortunately, we are still suffering from the mindset that go only government can do a few things here. They take two steps forward and four steps backward. This is what happens here. They said because the inspector's raj is still rampant, I went for a function, and it is on record. It is not just something here, I'm saying out of the air. Sheila Dixit, in her second term, she went to, there's a Okhala industrial area in Delhi. They said, this, what are your demands? He said, probably they will say here, electricity, space, and this thing. He says, please have a single point window of corruption. We have to bribe some 65 inspectors who come. So, the <laughs> point is, this is a demand. I mean, I told Sheila Dixit, she said, yes, I remember that they told me in the, in the TV program also. So, China can make progress, others can make progress here. But uh, for the reasons which I have explained to you, I did not go into detail here. Government has its own compulsion, it has to carry fish, fowls, <laughs> and all kinds of animals with them and the coalition dharma as the Prime Minister says here. I think, but still, it is not uh, one dollar. In fact, the minimum wages in Delhi is something like six dollars a day, 330 rupees or so. Even the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme gives you two and a half uh, dollars a day. So do, do not go by what media say, they will only say, tell you what you will be, what will be shocking, what will be this thing here, tell you. I think country is doing reasonably well with the constraints we have. Even with the best of prime ministers, there is no way you can do that. And secondly, it's everywhere. It's not only in India. All politicians are alike. Khrushchev said, politicians promise to bring, build bridges where no rivers exist. Ronald Reagan said, I thought that the politics is the old, uh, 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 prostitution is the oldest profession in the world, but I have come to realize that politics also is somewhere close to them also. So this is a, when you have a democracy, I will only quote Winston Churchill, who said this is the worst form of government, but it is much, much worse than all the forms which have been tried before that. So, Comparison with China may be good in some way, 
But since we have chosen this system where we listen to all Tom, Dick and Harry, anybody is free to say anything here, except where I think the vote bank politics comes here. And uh, you can get along with this. There's no such thing in China. Then in Tiananmen Square, they killed uh, hundreds and thousands of people when they wanted to quell this thing. But you couldn't do anything at all. They could uh, throw a shoe on uh, Rahul Gandhi. He said, Arby, thank you. He said something more on this one. So this is part of the life. But I think reasonably we have good reason to pat ourselves on the back. It's not only in Delhi. The awakening which has come in India to make every person feel that he counts is something great. Thank you, sir. Well, I should... Uh, this is with regard to uh, the figure that uh, Mr. Kapil Sibyl mentioned yesterday. I'd like to make a little clarification. When Kapil Sibyl talked about uh, close to six to seven hundred million people living below two dollars a day, it did not necessarily mean that was a poverty threshold line. There's, there's no poverty criteria line in India two dollars a day. International criteria is also close to one point two five dollar a day, but in India it's, it's almost close to three fourths of a dollar a day. So about a decade ago, we had close to 42% of our population below poverty line. And 10 years down the line, we come down to close to 29, 29 I mean, that's the current figure, but 29%. So our, our, our cutoff line for poverty, when we measure people below poverty line, is it, close to even, like, even less than three, four hundred dollars a day. Because it, we take into account our levels of consumption, our price line, because it cannot be compared with the international figure of $1.25 a day. And Mr. Seppel very rightly pointed out $2 a day and nearly six to seven million people living below $2 a day. And don't forget, in any way, well, the rupee has depreciated against the dollars. $2 a day, we have a population of about six to seven hundred million people living less than $2 a day. But that doesn't mean these 700 million people are poor. We don't, do not bring them under the uh, poverty line. Thank you. This is Rita Kumar from the United States.